In this video, I'm going to show how to make two different styles of conical cups using a conical pattern that I made. This conical pattern will be in the video description. There's a link to it um, where you could print it out on eight and a half by 11 paper and it should print out almost the exact same size that I have it here. Um, what I did in the case of this was I did a straight one that was just the normal pattern and then on the second one I actually bellied it out so it gave it a little bit more of a roundness and a fullness and a little bit more volume as well for uh, whatever it's containing. For the tools that I'm using in the video, I will have links to all of these in the video description. I have a Google Doc with, um, a, it's a live Google Doc with links for uh, a lot of the tools are on Amazon with my associate links um, and some will be directly to uh, websites. Rolling out a slab, I'm using the same technique I've used in several other videos. Um, you can consult some of the others for a little bit more detailed information. Uh, I am rolling out the clay, flipping it, and rotating it, trying to stretch it evenly. I am using the hardwood quarter inch thick slab sticks on either side of my clay, and I keep rolling and flipping until I'm eventually down to the level of the slab sticks. When I'm down fully to the level of sticks, I rib with a, that's a mud tools rib that I'm using, and the compression of the clay is the most important thing about ribbing. It will strengthen your slab as well as smooth it. Those are green mud tool ribs, the really long ones as well. Now that I have my slab rolled and compressed, I'm going to dust it very lightly with a little bit of cornstarch. Cornstarch uh, will burn off. This is just regular cornstarch that you would, you know, buy in uh, the grocery store. Cornstarch will burn off in the kiln and it will allow it to uh, uh, be textured without having too much uh, stuff sticking to it. I'm going to position mine so I'm just going to lightly mark where it's going to go. I'm marking it a little bit bigger because I'm going to texture and try to texture it within that arch because I'm going to be using a roller. Okay, so the texturing tool that I'm using, this is an MKM roller. I will put a link in the video description. And I am going to start before the pattern and I'm going to just try to make it a nice smooth continuous roll. And I kind of arched it, I curved it. I'll do that again. And you don't always necessarily have to do cornstarch when you're using these uh, nice wooden rollers, but if your clay is a little bit on the plastic side, you may want to do that. Now, this roller is a little bit shorter than my pattern, so I tried to position the part that I'm not texturing up at the top, so the rim will not be textured up there. If you did end up by texturing it, you could easily rib over that. Now that I have it textured, I'm going to position my pattern on top of the texture and I'm going to trim this away. Now I am using an acetate as uh, my pattern or maybe it's mylar, I, I forget now, but I will put a link in the video description. I actually buy this in large quantity rolls um, from Amazon. And it's really nice because it's super durable. I use it in my classroom for my students, so I keep patterns on hand that the kids can use. And um, they, it just will not fall apart like paper will. Uh, I've had paper patterns that you know fail after several uses because the kids aren't that careful with it. I'm going to keep two of these pieces that I can use for the bottom. So I'm gonna hang on to maybe these two pieces. I'll trim off some of this. Okay. 
and obviously I'm going to be doing two. So the one piece that I wanted to use as the bottom for this, I'm going to go ahead and texture that as well. There we go. And my bottom pattern, I'll trim out from that. And as I tell my students, keep all this scrap loose like this, squirt it down generously, put it back in the bag, and after it sits for a few minutes, it'll absorb all that water that you just applied to it by squirting it down, and it'll be good usable clay again. Now, whenever you make a form where the slab is going to come together, you wanna to make sure that you are beveling those ends. I know I've shown this in other videos, but this gives you an explanation. So these ends are beveled on this board. When you have a beveled end that goes together on a slab, it will overlap like that, and then it's um, fairly easy to smooth and to join well. If you put two ends together that are, this would be called a butt joint, like in woodworking, it's a butt joint. If you put it together like that, that's much more difficult to smooth together. So for beveling, you could use one of the really super cool um, tools. I think it's called uh, SIM. I don't really know how you pronounce it. SIM, maybe X-I-E-M. Uh, this is a bevel cutter that they have. It has a wire here and a wire here. You just hold the wire part into the clay. So it's, this is cutting a 45. I am using uh, the wood edge as a guide as I draw it along and that will cut. This is cutting probably, I think it's more than a 45 degree, I think it's probably about a 60 degree. So this one I've cut like this and the other angle, the corresponding angle has to be the same. Now you could do the same exact thing if you were using a knife, but I'm right-handed so I'd turn it over this way to demonstrate. So if I were beveling with a knife, I would hold my knife at this angle, right? cut this side and then move it to the other side holding at exactly the same angle and do an undercut. On this one I'm going to flip it so I can use this tool and trim that away. There we go. Now I'm going to prep both beveled edges by scoring and I'm just slipping one of those two edges. I'm going to stand it up and overlap the bevels. As I push this together, I'm not really worried about blending the seam on the outside. I, I actually prefer to see a little bit of the seam, but what I do need to do is blend the seam on the inside. So wherever you can see that seam on the inside, you want to make sure that you're getting that blended. And you could use a variety of tools. I'm just using the end of the Kemper wooden knife. Again, I'll put a link in the video description. I also like that wooden Kemper tool that's kind of pointy, looks a little like a pencil. I think it's the WT-12. I'll put a link to that one in the video description too. I like that one a lot. All right, it's now a cone, and I'm ready to attach the base. I'm going to score and score the top edge of the base so the textured side is going to be visible. 
I will slip one of those, making sure that this looks nice and round. It matches up. I'm just going to gently tap it. Now, I'll show you, there are many different ways that you could address this. I could just leave it like this, but I'm going to take a little roller and I'm going to roll that edge. I'm going to just set this on this so I can spin it. I'm going to roll this edge upward ever so slightly. That really does help to embed these, uh, the scoring together. Now, down in there, for my students, I recommend that you add a coil. Many people don't add foils because they're, uh, you know, they're really experienced and they know the moisture of their clay really well. But for my students, I highly suggest add a coil for extra security. I am going to score and slip the coil as I put it in. I have the coil laying in there, and now I'm going to blend. And there's a nice little cone blended on the inside. And now I'm going to do the second one, sped up. I'm beveling the ends, scoring and slipping, putting together those bevels. You can see how they go together. And then blending the interior of the seam, both on the top and the bottom, scoring and slipping, attaching the slipped and scored base onto it. And then I roll that edge a little bit with the roller. And then I roll another little coil, score and slip, place it on the inside, and then blend it well. All right, so I've made two matching uh, conical mugs using my simple pattern. I want to show you how you can do a variation of that, and I'm going to take this one and I'm going to um, kind of belly it out. So I've done this on my tripod cup, on my straight slab cup in the past, but I hold the cup at the top and the bottom, and I gently take my fingers on the inside of the wall, and the clay is still plastic. Then I push it out as I am moving my fingers upward. And you just do a little bit at a time, not too much all at once. You don't want to rip it. You don't want to stretch it too much, so a little bit at a time. I'm going to gradually stretch this to your desired form. Here we go. I'd like to show you the contrast there. The stretching of the belly of the conical form really just uh, is rather transformative with your uh, cup form. Now, you can see how thick the rim is. That's still a little bit too thick for uh, a cup, in my opinion. So I'm going to take my fingers and I could do this part when it's a little bit closer to leather hard. I'm just going to get some of it done today. I'm just thinning a little bit. I'm holding underneath the rim so I don't modify the shape all that much. And I'm just kind of squeezing between two wet fingers, thinning it and rounding the upper edge. All right, 
As I look at it, I want to make sure that it looks symmetrical all the way around. I want my rim to look nice and round. And the little trick, I'm just using a regular old round funnel. I'm just going to kind of set that in there. It's a little sticky right now. I'll probably do it again when it's a little closer to leather hard so it's not quite so sticky. But by putting a funnel in there, that will help to round it up. Before I allow this to get leather hard fully, I'm going to take a stiff clay cleaning brush that I have. In my students' tool bins, I keep some very stiff bristled brushes that we can use for cleaning the clay. And I just wanted to make sure that I got some of my tool marks out from down in the bottom. Round that up, and I'm going to set it aside. Cleaned up this one also with a paintbrush. Uh, note that you don't want to clean something like that up with a sponge. If you're using a clay like mine, it's a grogged stoneware. If you were to sponge a grogged stoneware, you'll leave a gritty, groggy surface that's visible behind. You really don't want that. I'm going to show the fake pulled handle technique that I uh, teach my students as high schoolers who are fairly beginners. Um, pulled handles are uh, pretty difficult for them, so I teach a fake pulled handle. I learned this trick from Sandy Parentosi years ago. I start off with a coil that is shaped and tapered like a carrot. Then I'm going to smack the carrot down. She referred to this as the carrot slam when I saw her do it. And then I'm going to hold the big end and kind of compress and kind of stretch it. What that does is it thins it and it tapers it. Okay. Now before I bend it, I am also going to texture that. So I'll just set that to the side. And then I'm going to do the same thing with these. I'm going to pull up. I thin. I'm wiping off some of the water with my fingers. Set it aside. I usually tell my students make more handles than you do than you have cups because inevitably you're going to have some that look a little bit better than others, and you can use the best ones. All right. Now, for each of these handles, I want to add a little bit of a texture, like I have on my cups. So I'm going to add some cornstarch, because these handles are a little bit on the wet side now. And the cornstarch will help to keep the wooden roller from sticking. So my pattern, I'm going to go side to side on this one. And then I'll show you how I'll position that on the tray in a second. There we go. And we'll do another one like that. Okay. So now that I have my two plastic cups sitting here uh, on the tray, I'm going to place my handles with them. I usually take the fat end and stick that down and then curve the smaller end around. Now these are bigger than I'll actually use, of course. I will trim off some of that excess. Then I'm going to cover all of these with a bag over the tray. The reason I use plastic is so um, they don't dry out too much. I'm going to let everything become the same moisture consistency of leather hard 
before I attach. All right, I have had my cups and my handles covered on a tray and they are now leather hard. Um, I am going to be attaching uh, the handles onto these and they need to be the same moisture content. The most important thing is do not allow the uh, one of the two to get a lot drier than the other. Now, when I am attaching a handle on a slab mug, I usually like to put it where the seam is located. Now, I, quite often, I will hold it, say like I'm doing right here, I will hold it behind it and get a sense of the contour, how big, how wide I would want this handle to be. Obviously, I'm not sticking it on like this. I'm going to be trimming it off some. So, I'm going to hold it behind it so I can visualize a little bit better and then I'm going to mark it okay based on pretty much the way that I like it okay so I have it marked right there now when I trim this excess clay off one of the most important things to keep in mind is that you want to keep this even and right now I'm not very even right there so I want to make sure that it's not got a weird angle at it I am curving it though you can see that it's curved slightly there that way it's going to curve and match the contour of the cup and then down here this one same thing I want to make sure it's not angled weirdly and I sometimes like to curve that gently as well. Okay, so this handle I'm going to have kind of it's going to have an upward sweep coming away from the cup. And again, I am positioning it on the seam. That is totally a personal preference. Some people may not like it there. I like to have it on, on the seam myself. Now, when I have that in the place that I like, then I'm going to just mark it using whatever tool I have at hand, if it's a needle tool, or in this case, I'm gonna use the knife. I'm just going to mark where the ends are going to go and then I'm going to aggressively score this. Okay, I've really scored it. Then you can use slip, you can use water, you can use vinegar, but I'm going to slip that scoring and I'm going to let that sit for a minute Then I'm going to come in here and I'm going to score the handle I'm also going to put a little slip on that okay and now with the attachment I'm going to stand up to make sure that this is not at a weird angle I'm going to press it on there very firmly top and bottom and I'm holding my finger on the inside so as I was pressing I didn't cave in the cup or anything and this cup is leather hard at this point because I did allow everything to stiffen up of course okay now right underneath here I usually like to do just a little blending not too much because I don't want to interfere with the great texture that I have going on there from my roller. And then I'm going to clean that up with a small brush and a little bit of water. Clean up that connection there. One of the biggest mistakes that people make is they either do not put the handle on when it's the same moisture as the cup or Perhaps they don't allow it to dry slowly and evenly, and part of it will dry out too quickly. 
So it's going to take slow and even drying to make sure that this is not going to have any cracking or anything. I'm going to just push that out a little bit down at the bottom so it can accommodate a finger a little bit more. Okay. Now I'm just going to refine that foot a little bit. If you remember, I had rubbed or I had uh, rolled that edge a little bit. Now I'm just going to take my fingers and kind of refine the foot. I'm just kind of pushing it up a little bit and I'll even tap up a little bit on the bottom there. That is looking pretty good. I wanna check on the interior, make sure I don't have any blemishes. Again, just like I did before, I could use a stiff bristled wet brush if I had any blemishes in there. Once again, I'll put the funnel in the top and make sure that that appears really nice and round. And now here I'm just speeding this up, but I'm attaching the handle in the same manner that I did before. Try to cut it to make sure it's not at a weird angle. Um, I mark the cup, score, and slip aggressively. Um, when I attach it, I press it on firmly, making sure that I'm supporting it from the inside of the cup. And then I'm blending it with a little paintbrush and cleaning it up and cleaning up the foot a little bit. All right. So down here, I'm going to put a little pinky rest um, because I would imagine that I'm probably going to fit three fingers in there. My pinky would hook on the outside. So I'm going to attach. It's uh, basically, I start with the shape of like a bean. And this is just handle clay that I've trimmed away, so I know it's the same moisture. So I start with like a bean and then I squish it to a wedge. Hopefully that makes sense. It's, and then the wedge shape I will attach. And the little part that sticks out is the lower part because my, my finger will hook into that. And I'm just gonna gently blend that. Again, trying to be careful not to disturb my textures. In there, so it would be something like that. Now, just a, a little cautionary note, I usually tell students never pick up a mug by the handle until it gets fired. Um, if you do it too prematurely, you could break the handle off. And lastly, I'm going to round this one up same way that I did earlier. Okay. And once again, I'll just tidy up a little bit of that inside seam right there in the paintbrush. That's basically how I made two conical cups from a conical pattern. Um, check out one of my other videos if you need to have a little bit more of a tutorial on uh, different patterns. Finally, I'd like to have a note about drying. Uh, there's almost nothing worse than when the kids in my class have made such beautiful items and then they forget everything that they've learned about drying when they put it in the drying cabinet. If you don't dry things slowly and evenly, you can easily get cracking and warping, which we do not want. Um, so in the case of these cups, 
to allow it to dry slowly and evenly, I recommend that my students take a heavy towel, and this is just an old terry cloth towel, um, and place it over it. That will allow moisture to escape, but yet hold in some moisture so it can go slowly. And if you want to go even slightly slower, you could just gently drape a bag over the top so it's not sealed. And then that will ensure that you have a slow, even dry with minimal cracks.